Bien, eh, esta es parte de los seminarios del Instituto de Geofísica. En, este, en esta ocasión eh, fue sustituida la charla debido a que el, el, el colega que estaba encargado de la charla, Emilio Herrero, de la Universidad de Hawái, canceló hace como un mes. Y bueno, como yo tenía aquí de invitado al doctor Amar Argabal, Argarbal, este, eh, más cerca como pasó que acá un par de años, entonces este, se me ocurrió invitarlo y sustituir la charla. Entonces, este, bueno, el doctor Amar, vamos a dejarlo en Amar, es más fácil para mí, este, eh, eh, justo recibió su, su doctorado en junio de, la, de este año, tiene actualmente cuatro publicaciones indexadas y está en el proceso dos más. Y bueno, lo conocí en Alemania el año pasado durante mi estancia. Eh, de medio año de, 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 de sabático y bueno, hay una buena relación, él es muy joven, es muy entusiasta y esperamos que la disfrute aquí en México. Eh, el tema, bueno, ahí está en el escrito, Shock Wave Induced Micro Zones and Localization of Shock Energy. Es una nueva temática en el estudio de las de los, eh, rocas de impacto y bueno, hay más, hay más, hay más ideas respe al respecto que las vamos a ir explorando con el tiempo. Si hay, si hay alguien interesado, pues obviamente están invitados a participar. Este, y bueno, les dejo con, con ustedes el doctor Amar. Hello, hello. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Luis, for that kind introduction. I don't understand Spanish, but I hope he said only good things about me. Yeah. <laughs> and so today I'm going to talk about shock wave induced micro shear zones and localization of shock energy. Now it's a very new topic. It has a lot of geophysics, geology, crystallography. So please stop me and ask questions if you don't understand. Also, my English is a little bit weird. So if you don't understand, just ask me the questions immediately, okay? All right, so during this talk, I will be briefly uh, discussing about what the mineral lingonite is, what are shock-induced shear zones. And for this study, I have taken samples from the Loch Ness crater in Sweden. So I will talk briefly about the regional geology of the Loch Ness Crater, and then we will talk about the micro shear zones at mineral interfaces in dolerites. So, yeah. So before I start, I would like to give you a few, few concepts about uh, shear zones or shock-induced shear zones. Consider that there are two rock types or two lithologies or two minerals which have very different physical properties or very different Poisson's ratio. For this example, uh, Kenkman has taken oh, shit. Yeah, Kenkman has taken quartzite and dunite. Now quartzite has a higher Poisson's ratio than dunite. So consider this to be quartzite and this to be dunite and there is an imaginary boundary between the two. And this is the direction of the propagation of shock wave. Now shock wave is a simple elastic wave and so it travels with different velocity in different materials. Now since quartzite is harder, what happens is that the shock waves moves faster in quartzite and slower in dunite. So although the shock wave is moving in this direction, it's moving faster in quartzite and slower in dunite. So at the boundary, there is a kind of shear zone like this. Because the shock wave is faster in quartzite and slower in dunite, there will be shearing at the grain boundary. And the shearing leads to development of locales with high pressure and temperature. It's similar to trans zone of transmission in tectonic settings, okay? The second thing which I want to talk about is the mineral lingonite. Now, 99% of times when we come across a plagioclase, it's a, it's a triclinic mineral. But lingonite is a high pressure temperature polymorph of sodic plagioclase, which is tetragonal. And it forms at pressures more than 20 gigapascal and, and temperatures over 1000 degrees centigrade. So when we compress a sodic plagioclase at pressures more than 20 gigapascal and temperatures over 1000 degrees centigrade, it compresses to form lingonite, which is a tetragonal mineral. And we'll talk about this more. Now, this is the Loch Ness impact crater. This is the point of impact. It's an old impact crater formed in Ordovician some 455 million years ago. At the time of impact, there was six to 700 meter deep sea then a 70 to 80 meter thick uh, sedimentary cover, and then the crystalline basement rocks. Now the crystalline basement rocks consisted of metavolcanics, granites, and dolerites. We will talk about dolerites in this study. Now Lindstrom in 2005 did shock pressure modeling and showed that uh, in this region, the shock pressure is more than three gigapascal 
In this region, it is between 3 and 1 gigapascal, then 1 and 0 0.3 gigapascal, and so on. Now, these sample locations are of dolerites, and I will talk about later what's black and white. But let's see at sample number 49, according to Lindstrom, the shock pressures were less than 0 0.1 gigapascal. Please remember this, this is important. Now, during the microscopic study of the dolerites, I found that usually the mineral boundaries, the boundaries between two minerals is pretty straight. But sometimes the boundaries between augite and plagioclase are sort of feathery. They are intermingled with each other. On zooming in further, we see that they are alternating lamellies of augite and labradorite. So the boundaries between the augite and labradorite grains are like this. They are interfingered with each other. And this, this kind of a structure I can see at all locations which are marred in black at sample number 25, 26, 28, 3, 33, and 49. For this study, I have taken sample number 49 which has suffered short pressures of less than 0 0.1 gigapascal. Now, since I'm a structural geologist, the first thing I did was to plot all of this in a steronet. So this is a steronet. I use direction x and y to plot the, to plot the plane of the micrograph. This is the blue arc. Then uh, this angle, angle from this to this angle, from here to sample number 49, this angle is about 30 degrees. So the direction of shock wave would be 30 degrees from north. Then I used, uh, I plotted these microfractures as rake. This is the green dot of these microfractures marked by green arrow. The lamellies marked by red arrow are plotted over here. Now, previous studies have shown us, or we already know that uh, shock waves are elastic waves. They have a compressive phase and a decompressive phase. A compressive phase and a decompressive phase. Now, in a compressive phase, the compression acts like this, and the fractures form parallel to the shock wave propagation direction. These fractures are termed as radial fractures. The radial fractures are parallel to shock wave propagation direction. Okay? Then there is a decompressive phase in which the material is pulled like this and the fractures form perpendicular to the shock wave propagation direction. These fractures are known as concentric fractures. So, I plotted the expected radial microfractures parallel to the shock wave propagation direction and the concentric fractures perpendicular to the shock wave direction. And interestingly, these fractures marked by green arrow coincide with that, with the radial fracture trend. So we can say that these fractures are radial fractures. Now the more interesting thing is that the lamellies coincide with the, with the expected trend of concentric fractures, which raises a question that, all right, in the compressive phase of the short wave, the radial, fra the radial fractures formed, but how did the lamellies form in the decompressive phase of the short wave? We can expect fractures, but these are lamellies, and these lamellies are filled by labradorite. So we'll see this, how they form. Now, I'm already at the highest resolving power of the optical microscope. So we did a scanning electron microscopy, and these are the, how the lamella look like. These are the labradorite lamella, and these are the augite lamella. Now, you see that the boundaries of this lamella are pretty straight. They are not smudged with each other. They are very sharp. And um, so, and, and uh, the microfractures, the radial microfractures are present only in augite, marked by white arrows, and not in labradorite. So by the simple concept of cross-cutting relationship, one can predict that the radial fractures formed first, and the labradorite lamellae formed afterwards. This is a very important concept over here. The radial fractures formed first, and the labradorite lamellae formed afterwards, because the fractures are not present in the lamellae. Now, this lamellar structure to any structural geologist would look like an echelon, an echelon of shear fractures. So, if we mark the shear direction over here, yeah, we will see that this is a result of a sinistral shear zone. What happens is, if we, if we shear the rock like this, the fractures form, open up like this, and labradorite is somehow moving into the fractures. Now, we already know from the concept that they could be shearing at the grain boundaries due to shock wave. But how this happens, we will see later. What other important thing over here is that these, now these are the pits. They are formed because labradorite was very thin over here, and when we were preparing the sample, the labradorite broke off. 
but you can see the boundaries the ends of the labradorite lamella they are slightly curved they are not straight you see however the augite the labradorite lamella are very pointy the augite lamella are slightly curved this is a typical represent, representation of material which is sheared off during uh, sh during shearing so if there is shearing and the material is not strong enough the tips of the lamella are sheared off i will show this later in in proper models but let's go on when we go to a higher resolution we see again that the microfractures are present only in augite they are not present in labradorite and one of these radial microfractures is filled with labradorite from the adjacent lamella now again if we make a sequence of deformation events and we take all what we have studied till now there are three steps in the first step of the compressive phase these radial microfractures are forming these fractures then in the second step there is some kind of shearing we don't know what and somehow these lamella are forming which are concentric to the impact crater then in the third stage there is again compressive phase and labradorite from the lamella is pushed into these microfractures but to understand the structural deformation over here and if there is come some kind of uh, chemical changes we did micro raman spectroscopy we did two kind of spectroscopy one was a line scan in which we scanned the labradorite lamella point number 1 2 and 3 and we see that as we move into the lamella the uh, the peaks broaden and shift either to a higher value either to a higher value or to a lower value this indicates that as we move into the lamella the labradorite is more deformed it's undeformed over here and the deformation increases towards the towards the tip of the lamella then i uh, compare the spectrum of bulk augite somewhere from here to bulk uh, labradorite and with the spectra for the interface now what i see from the interface is that it has got peaks of both labradorite and augite this is the peak of the labradorite and this is the peak of augite which is expectable however there is this one one peak at 820 which is neither present in augite nor in labradorite now this peak is interesting because it it is neither represented by augite nor labradorite so now the and the shape of the peak is slightly broad you can see that these peaks are very sharp however this peak is broad now a broad roman peak could be because of three reasons it could be due to deformed crystal lattice it could be due to presence of randomly oriented microcrystals or it could be due to presence of amorphous phase we will check all of these possibilities but let's remember that the 820 peak is broad now i compare this spectrum or this peak to all the known transformation phases of augite and labradorite so not only the polymorphs but also the transformation phases and what i find is that this 820 peak corresponds to this peak 820 peak of lingonite which is compressed to 19 gigapascal now what happens when you compress something the crystal lattice gets deformed and this crystal lattice deformed crystal lattice could be a reason of the broad shape of 820 peak this is our first indication of presence of lingonite at the interface now remember that the shock pressures uh, seen by this rock or experienced by, by this rock were very less less than 0.1 gigapascal and lingonite forms at 20 gigapascal so there is a very large gap in the shock pressures and this is a question that how did this happen how did lingonite form first we will prove by another method that lingonite actually occurs over here and then we will see a hypothesis that how it forms okay now to check the raman results we have three raman results now the labradorite is more deformed in the lamella there is presence of lingonite and the lingonite crystal is deformed we will check all of these three raman results by high resolution transmission electron microscopy or tem i made three tem lamellas let's first talk about Uh, tm section 1 which was made perpendicular to the labradorite lamella okay so this is the tm section inside the rock inside the rock a uh, thin section it's not prepared completely it's st still there but what you can see is the platinum coating over here you can see the augite and you can see the labradorite now the augite labradorite lamella margins this is a prepared thin section or tm section are straight they looked curved over here because the tm section is broad at the bottom so although the margins are straight since the 
TM section is not prepared, it's broad, so the straight margins look curved. However, the more important thing over here is that the lamella margins are making an angle of 83 degrees. Now, please remember this 83 degrees, it's very important. Then again, you can see the radial microfracture present only in augite and it's not present in labradorite, which we were seeing in, the, in our light microscope and scanning electron microscope. Now, this is a high resolution image of, the, of, this, of this TM section. And the electron diffraction pattern from the augite shows that the C axis of augite is the zone axis. Now, for those who are not uh, um, familiar with TEM, the zone axis is the axis perpendicular to the TEM section. So, when I say the C axis of augite is the zone axis, it means that the C axis of augite is oriented like this. It is oriented like this, perpendicular to the TEM section. And since the T and in this image, the C axis of augite is oriented like this, perpendicular to the TEM section. Okay or parallel to the labradorite lamella. Now, the high resolution transmission electron image of the contact zone shows nicely crystallized augite planes. They are very well crystallized. We can see all the lattice planes. We can see the atoms and the electrons. However, juxtaposed to it is the amorphous zone, which has got some randomly oriented nanocrystals, which are marked by this white marquee. Now, remember the broad shape of Raman band. It could have been because of the amorphous phase. And this is the proof that the amorphous phase at the contact zone caused the broad shape of Raman band. Now, since augite is very well crystallized, we made a FFT fast Fourier transformation and then an inverse fast Fourier tra transformation and calculated the D spacing, which came out to be 2.98 angstrom. Now, I use this as an internal reference to characterize this, these nanocrystals. Now, the D spacing of these nanocrystals comes out to be 2.61 angstrom, which is, which corresponds to that of lingonite. So, this is the second proof that we have got lingonite at the contact zone. When we zoom in into the inverse fast Fourier transformation, we see that the lingonite has got a lot of pointage dislocations. This pointage dislocations means that the lingonite crystal lattice is deformed, which we saw in the Raman. The lingonite crystal was compressed to 19 GPA and it was deformed. And now we can see by our eyes visually that the lingonite crystal is deformed. Some of the lattices are absent. Okay. So, till now, the TEM results correspond with that of Raman, that is the presence of lingonite, presence of amorphous phase, and a presence of multiply oriented nanocrystals which are deformed. Now, let's talk about TEM section 2 and 3. 3 is from the undeformed part of the labradorite and 2 is from the labradorite lamella. Now, when we compare these two, this is from the bulk labradorite undeformed and this is from the lamella. You see that the inverse fast Fourier transformation shows very nice lattice planes in labradorite from the bulk. However, that from the lamella has got many edge dislocations. It's quite, it's highly deformed. Sorry. Now, we already see in, in Raman spectroscopy that as we move into the lamella, the labradorite is getting deformed. Over here, we can see that the labradorite in the lamella is much more deformed than the bulk labradorite. Now, how this, help, how this is going to help us? This is going to help us to make a model of the formation of the interfingering structure and a hypothesis for the formation of lingonite at such low shock pressures. Now, to explain my hypothesis, let's consider this to be the crystal structure. This is the augite in brown, the labradorite. I use two kind of sections. This is a vertical section and the white square represents the section of the micrograph. I'll use these two to explain the formation of the structure. And this is the C axis of augite, which we found is perpendicular to the lamella. This is schematically the direction of the shock wave and this is not. So, initially, this is augite and this is labradorite. Let's talk about this view because this is what we see in the scanning electron microscope or in the optical microscope. This is the direction of the shock wave. Now, in the compressive phase, when the shock wave comes, the sigma 1 is like this and there is formation of fractures perpendicular or sorry, parallel to the sigma 1. These are the radial fractures. Now, just before the formation of the radial fractures, the shock wave passes through and there is shearing at the grain boundary. 
They are shearing at the grain boundary of augite and labradorite as the Kenkman has shown us. Now, since augite is 15% more stronger than labradorite, the short waves are 15% faster in augite. So they will be shearing and this shearing leads to formation of high pressure temperature locales in which the labradorite is compressed to form lingonite. Now, in the decompressive phase, the material is pulled away like this. The augite opens, which we can see over here, and labradorite somehow, somehow moves into these. Now, if you remember a multicolored toothpaste, when you press the toothpaste, the, the toothpaste still comes out in separately colored. The, the colors don't mix. It's a similar process. When, when the labradorite is pushed in, the lingonite material say moves along these fracture planes or along these shear planes and it's not mixed with the labradorite. It's similar to pressing or taking out a multicolored toothpaste. Now, <clears throat> what happens next is again there is a again there is a compressive phase, the third, and there is shearing. Now, since augite is, is stronger than lab is, is stronger than labradorite, the tips of the labradorite lamella are protected from the shearing. However, since labradorite is, is, is weaker, the tips of the augite are sheared off because of the shearing. And this is what we see in the scanning electron microscopy. Also during this time, somehow, some of the labradorite moves from the lamella into the microfractures. So this is my hypothesis of how the uh, lingonite forms and how this uh, kind of a structure forms. Now one question over here is that, why does augite fracture in such a systematic pattern? Usually in nature, Nothing happens in such a systematic pattern. You can take a scalar ruler and draw a straight line. Why this is happening? So now we will investigate this last part. But before that, this is my imagination or this is how the three-dimensional structure should look like. This is the shock wave. This is the augite in brown and this is the labradorite. These are the V-shaped lamellas which have an angle of 83 degrees. Parallel to the lamella is the C-axis of augite and this is where labradorite moves in like this. The red portion marks presence of lingonite and the amorphous phase. Now, yeah, I should bring this image later. Remember that the prismatic cleavage of augite is also parallel to the C axis of augite, and the angle between the prismatic cleavage of augite is also 83 degrees. So, this is the initial in indication that maybe these lamellas form along the cleavage planes of augite, but we have to investigate. So let's talk about TM section 1 again. This is a low resolution a TM image of the first section. This is augite and amorphous phase. You can also call it labradorite. Now you see the margin is slightly curved over here. And this is an image of augite taken from internet. It's taken from mineraldata.org. What's interesting over here is that the shape of the, lamb of the margin is very similar to the shape of the augite crystal. Then the angle alpha and alpha prime, beta and beta prime are also similar. We already know that this is the C axis, this should be the C axis of augite. And from our electron diffraction, we know that this is the C axis of augite. Now this indicates that probably these lamellar margins, which are at an angle of 83 degrees, are the prismatic cleavages of augite. Now, so I will bring you back over here. So possibly somehow during the decompressive phase, augite augite fractured along the cleavage planes and labradorite was pushed in. Now what's more important over here is that, remember when I told you that there are two kinds of fractures, fractures which form in the compressive phase like this and then a decompressive phase there are fractures like this. Now these fractures till now were thought to be parallel or perpendicular to the short wave propagation direction. However, now we see that these shock waves, uh, sorry these fractures are not perpendicular to a short wave propagation direction. They are following the weakest plane in the rock. They are, oh, in this case, they are following the cleavage planes and maybe in nature they are following some kind of faults, some kind of fractures, some kind of veins, we don't know that. But what we know is that concentric fractures are not perpendicular to a shock wave anymore. So the implication of this study are two folds. First, that <coughs> Even in rocks which have suffered very low shock pressures like 0 0.1 gigapascal or 1 gigapascal, they can be shearing at the grain boundaries. 
and this shearing can lead to formation of high pressure temperature locales in which high pressure phases like lingonite can form. Now, most of the short pressure modeling has been done uh, through numerical models, computer models or by, high pre or by uh, investigating phases like, bit, like uh, stichovite. But both of these give bulk pressures because of the computer uh, say constraint the pressures by numerical models gives a pressure of say about 10, 10 centimeter cube area. But at nanoscale, the pressure could be 10 to 20 times higher than expected. The second conclusion is much more important because what is an impact rate? Suppose this is the surface of a planet and then a projectile comes and hits. So there is a hemispherical depression. Now this hemispherical depression is nothing else but concentric fractures or faulting or slumping along these concentric fractures and faults. The, multi, the rings of a multi-ring basins are also concentric faults. And unfortunately, scientists have not been able to understand completely the evolution of these multi-ring basins because we have been thinking till now that the, sh that the concentric fractures form perpendicular to the shock wave and they are, they are tensile fractures. However, the present study shows that the concentric fractures are shear fractures and the orientation of these fractures is governed by the orientation of pre-existing mechanical, mechanical flaws in the rocks. So if there are pre-existing faults, if there is a pre-existing base, uh, say, um, discontinuity in the sedimentary rocks, if there is a fault, the morphology of the impact crater will be drastically, drastically affected by this pre-existing uh, mechanical flaws. And these are the two conclusions. Thank you. That's all. <laughs>